It's a fierce race among the world's best auto designers. In Korea, cars emit not pollutants, but water. It's a reverse reaction of uh, water hydrolysis. In Japan, vehicles rely on computerized eyesight to self-navigate the roads. Computers can help in many ways to supplement the weaknesses of the human driver. In Taiwan, the country's premier automaker is on the cusp of launching its first electric vehicle. I don't think we have the luxury of time to wait, so we need to do it very, very soon. And in Singapore, no gas stations, only battery exchange kiosks at every corner. That future may be closer than we think. The future is here, it is now. But major challenges await Asia's scientists and engineers as they explore new frontiers in motor and battery technologies, transform city infrastructure, and embrace wild innovations. There's a very broad skepticism around us. Car industry has to evolve into mobility industry. Without doing that, the car's gonna die. How will the world as we know it change? A race with billions of dollars at stake, and Asia is leading the competition. Fasten your seat belts. We're taking a ride straight into the future. Could this be the car of the future? A sleek little number made of lightweight carbon fiber, nicknamed the K07. It's in a way like Formula One on the street. In spite of its size, it packs a hefty punch. This car we call this K07 is just like a four-wheeled motorcycle. It doesn't have any roof. It has from about 190 horsepower to maybe about 230. But the main feature of the car is lightweight. It weighs less than 800 kilograms. The regular car weighs about double that weight, so it's agile. When you go into the corner, this is extension of your hands and legs. This is almost part of you. The K07 are collector's items. Only five of them exist in the world today. Is this a vision of cars of the future? Decades ago, the most innovative car designs often appeared in sci-fi films and popular TV shows. When we are young, we watch films where cars are portrayed in doing impossible things. Cars that can fly, cars that can go into the water. This taxi flies around in three dimensions and uh, you know, brings you right up to the 50th floor of your apartment and lands on your veranda, on your balcony and so on. And some of it's really far out. I mean, these cars are flying. Some of them can even time travel. They're all super slick, uh, aerodynamic, pod-shaped craft, you know, and, and they all make sounds like <laughs> Hollywood aside, the auto industry was indeed inspired by space-age technology. If we look back to the 50s and whatnot, the average American car was kind of caught up in a space age technology. Things were looking like rockets. And things had humongous tails on the back. Size was important because the um, American economy was booming. Today, the picture has changed. Sleek, light, and efficient cars are in. Seoul, Korea. Here, designers are dreaming up concept cars and letting their imagination go wild. But there's an extra element that designers need to inject into their ideas. Everybody's talking about the uh, environment. Many people also talk about the speed. But as a car designer, we think about the people. I don't want to lose the fun side of it. So fun to make people smile. Ho Young Bang is a Korean designer who's designed something out of this world. His concept car, nicknamed the OCE, fuses function with contemporary design. I'm usually trying to find out what is the good shape and good structure for the interior. 
in the real world, there are many challenges to design something. But sometimes, as a designer, I, th I believe we should be crazy. And maybe someone says it doesn't make sense, we cannot make it. But I think if there is uh, some proper reason, we should bring this idea to the real world. Over in Japan, Ken Okuyama is just one such designer who's turned his dream into a reality. With its futuristic design, the K07 is a little out of this world. Ken believes this is a sneak peek into the future. Not just on design, but propulsion. This car has two liter engine of internal combustion engine. It is very efficient because it's lightweight and lasts long. But that's not enough. Ken wants to take this car into the next century. We want to go beyond that. We believe in EV, electric vehicle. So uh, we're converting this uh, internal combustion engine into lithium-ion battery and inboard motor. Ken's convinced electric cars are the way of the future, even if the public hasn't quite caught on yet. When you think EV, electric car, you think it's boring? Uh-uh. It has an excellent performance of acceleration, better than the car I you know, have behind me. It has excellent energy total efficiency. And maybe the total range of driving is not that far right now, but it's going to be a lot longer, and you name it, in five years, 10 years, it's going to be far better than what you drive today. The race is on for a clean, low emission, alternative powered car. And we're coming down now into a time where things like gas prices, the availability of oil, are putting a premium on size and efficiency now. And we're moving into something that's maybe a little bit smaller and more efficient. We all know that today cars are uh, not very efficient. We all know that today cars pollute the environment. So in order to sustain growth uh, in cities in the future, we will have to do something about that. Central to these cars of the future, the motor. This is where the fiercest contest among automakers takes place. Francis Chen is the engineer behind Taiwan's premier EV, the Luxgen. This is a pure electric vehicle. As you can see, there's no sound when we drive. And uh, when we slow down, there is actually energy regeneration. So converting the connecting energy back into electricity so we will have more driving range. The cars emit no tailpipe pollutants, making them friendly to the environment. The electric motor does provide a much smoother performance than uh, internal combustion engine, only because it's a continuous operating system. In a car powered by a combustion engine, chemical energy is converted into mechanical energy. In an EV, it's electrical energy that's turned into mechanical energy. For years, Japanese car makers have dominated EV technology. But things are changing fast. The Japanese have a lot of advantages, a lot of arrows in their quiver in this new battle to take the lead in the efficient technology. But you're seeing companies uh, in, in places like Korea that are right on their heels and are, are, are serious competitors to take that mantle away from the Japanese. There's no question that what we see today is a global race uh, across all the continents to produce an efficient car and a safe car. So it's coming from new markets with surging sales in places like China and India. One country has been particularly aggressive in its push. Taiwan. The government recently pumped in $300 million to revamp its auto industry. There's a great sense of urgency in this sprint to the future. I don't think we have the luxury of time to wait, so we need to do it very, very soon. Taiwan's Luxgen is among those at the forefront. Their seven-seater multi-purpose electric vehicle is the first of its kind in the world. And because it'll be their EV debut, they're making sure all kinks are ironed out, especially safety standards. 
since the electric vehicle uses uh, high voltages, so we want to be absolutely sure that there is no opportunity for the electricity to leak out to the outside of the vehicle to have any way in contact with human beings. In Luxgen's labs, Francis and his team have also devised an innovative way of regenerating energy as the EV stops and starts. We are here uh, in a, what we call the chassis laboratory to demonstrate uh, the vehicle's efficiency in uh, various drive cycles. We're trying to simulate the condition so we can assess its overall efficiency, how the vehicle performance is delivered, and how the battery usage, how the system functions in that condition. But it's one thing to have prototypes, quite another to have them flying the roads in big cities. Turning something exciting on paper into a practical solution will prove to be the biggest challenge yet. It's a race into the future for automakers in Asia. And smack in the middle of Taipei is a test bed for the country's premier EV. This is the sprawling Yuan Shan district, home to museums, theme parks, and exhibition centers. Here, Luxgen's cars are being tested in a pilot project. Our EV will play the role of uh, shuttling visitors for uh, free uh, rides uh, around the park. And the park is about 2.5 kilometers long. And we are trying to use this opportunity to introduce to the customer what EV is, let them truly experience the advantages of the electric vehicle being quiet, high performance. 20 electric cars are used to chauffeur visitors between the metro stop and the theme park in what's described as a green journey. This project tests the viability of electric cars citywide. It also gives us an opportunity for our engineering to have a real world assessment of what the vehicle is performing. But EVs have limitations. One stumbling block to its viability in the market today? It's batteries. Battery technology is not up to the level that we would uh, desire to have compared to a gasoline. The necessity of having electric vehicle being efficient is uh, more important than ever. Right now, it takes 6,000 lithium-ion batteries, weighing half a ton, to power up just one electric car. The race is now on to make even smaller, efficient cells. Taiwanese manufacturer E1 Moli Energy Corp is at the forefront. The Moly cell is well known for revving up cordless power tools, laptops, and electric bicycles. But with EVs, the stakes are higher. The auto industry requires the batteries to be smaller and have higher capacities. 汽车厂现在对使用在电动汽车电池，事实上还是不满意的。他要求的是一个更长的行驶距离，所以这个是电池厂还要努力的一个方向。所以怎样把电池的能量密度提升，那你汽车充一次电能够行驶的距离，可以
As all users of electronic gadgets know, batteries sometimes die. Ever had the fear of being stranded in the middle of the road with no power to run your car? It's a phenomenon known as range anxiety. I imagine if you're talking on your mobile phone, and we've all had this happen, you're talking and suddenly the battery goes dead. Now that's very annoying. Imagine if you're driving down the car and your battery goes dead in your car and you're stuck on your way to work or you're stuck at a snowstorm or you're stuck way out in the middle of nowhere. That is going to be a big problem and a big uh, disincentive to buy these electric cars. For EVs of the future to fully take off, there must be a way for the batteries to be recharged. Our city's infrastructure will need to adapt and this may prove to be the biggest challenge facing future EV technology. Electric vehicles are geared to play a major role in the future. When this happens, the face of cities will change. One thing will morph to adapt to this new form of transportation, the city's infrastructure. Around the world, designers are thinking ahead. In Abu Dhabi's Mastar City, a future metropolis fueled by renewable energy, Ken Okuyama's latest vision is being proposed. We talk a lot about the smart grid, which is the, the system to exchange the energy with the automobile or whatever the devices attached to your home or offices. For example, your car's EV, and during the night, you recharge your battery, when the price of the electricity is cheap, then if you don't need it during the day, you actually sell the electricity back to the city or back to the school or back to the company, and you get the money back. And when you go to Starbucks or when you go to 7-Eleven, you hook up your car and you get recharge of the battery or uh, you sell the energy back to the city. We call this smart grid. Singapore. The island city-state is bracing itself for the ride into the future, pumping in millions of dollars to develop a burgeoning industry. Its roads, a living laboratory for electric vehicles of the next generation. Singapore is ideal for electric cars and electric transportation. The average Singaporean drives 55 kilometers a day, which is well within the distance that you can get from a full charge of a battery. So we are small, we are compact. Beyond its size, Singapore has another advantage, a robust electricity grid and IT network. One immediate plan, a system of EV charging stations throughout Singapore. One of the first to do this is Green Lots. Theirs is a series of solar powered charging hubs. What you might see here is a typical bus shelter, but it's actually not. It is um, a shelter where you can park your vehicles below and it charges the electric vehicle from power by the sun. So the sun, the radiation comes down here to the solar panels, it charges battery here below me and with some kind of electronics it charges the motor or the battery of our electric vehicles. And if solar power is not feasible, Greenlots plans to install smart charging points like this one around the city. Smart charging that allows me to come up um, with just an RFID pass, tap and unlock for me to plug in and charge. And while I'm doing that, it's reporting to the internet how much energy I'm using. And I also can check with my phone when I go back um, how much energy I used, where I charged and basically how much I spent on charging my bike. The idea of having multiple charging stations throughout the city is attractive. But what about the possibility of charging while on the go? A highly appealing thought, considering the sheer size of batteries. If you are to put enough batteries to propel a vehicle that can go, say, 400 miles or 300 miles, the size of the battery is so big and the weight is so heavy that it will literally take up all the space available in the vehicle. Why carry all that energy on the vehicle? Why not supply energy externally by providing power from external environment? Seoul, Korea. 
here, this is close to reality, but not without skeptics. It was a very tough challenge from the beginning. And all the researchers and leaders are kind of, can he really achieve that? Um, there's uh, other people looking at us, hey, that's gonna, not going to happen. You are not going to achieve that. There's uh, a very broad skepticism around us. At the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology, In Soo Su and his team have devised a revolutionary way to charge EVs while remaining on the road. This is the OLEV, or Online Electric Vehicles. We completely converted from diesel-operated engine room to purely electric-operated powertrain. But this is no ordinary electric bus. The secret to its power? Magnetic strips on the ground. The Olive sucks up power, even though there is no contact. We have a dynamically transferring power from the road, and we have a pickup devices installed underneath the vehicle so that we can have a wireless charging while the vehicle is in driving. Because the bus is charged on the go, there's one huge advantage. If this bus is purely electric bus, then the battery size of this black box will be five times of this size. The bus's battery is more compact, making it light and efficient. At every point of passenger drop-off, the bus gets powered up. By having this dynamic charging system, we don't have to build a, a new investment in establishing infrastructure for charging. Right now, the Olive's still on trial, flying the routes only within campus. But Insu wants to prove it can work in the real world. The stakes are high for him to show its feasibility. Just an hour from downtown Seoul is the city's Grand Park. Here, Insu's running the perfect test. This project is our first public launch of, of the oil EV technology. With a clearly marked route, these trams function exactly like the Olev buses. We converted one of the tram operated by diesel into a completely a purely electric, only electric vehicle. Throughout the park, blue strips line its roads. Uh, you are looking at this uh, blue strip where we installed the power track. Each blue strip has a, a 24 meter power cable. We completely uh, clear out all the safety concerns related with electromagnetic fields. You can touch it, you can step on it. While the electric vehicle is poised to make an impact in the near future, some scientists believe the EV is only a transition technology. Something else may be rising far on the horizon. The personal transport of the future isn't necessarily going to be dominated by electric vehicles. At this G1 race in Singapore, cars hit the circuit in what's seen as the eco-friendly answer to Formula One. Speed dynamos dash to the end. But these are not powered by regular fuel. Instead, what drives them? Alternative energy. Around the world, automakers are competing to develop one such alternative energy, hydrogen fuel cells. In a fuel cell vehicle, the fuel is uh, pure hydrogen. So 
So the hydrogen is stored in the tanks at very high pressure. High pressure hydrogen tanks may be the key to the car of the future, but there's a challenge, public perception of its safety. To a lot of people who remember history would be remember the uh, airship Hindenburg where it explodes in the air. Seven million cubic feet of inflammable hydrogen gas blazed up in less than a minute. The hundreds of tons of fuel oil burns. There's a kind of a perception gap. So there's a lot of education is required in order to convince the public that uh, hydrogen fuel cell is safe. Today's engineers and scientists have devised a way to ensure the safety of these hydrogen-powered cars. Only a small number has been built in Japan, Korea, and the U.S. But its advocates are convinced of its long-term potential. The fuel cell uh, is a very clean source of energy. When you use fuel cell, basically, uh, you do not generate any kind of conventional uh, pollutants like uh, CO2, NOx, or SOx. The key to the running of HFC vehicles lies inside the fuel cell stack. It converts hydrogen fuel and oxygen from the air into electricity through a series of electrolyte plates. A byproduct of this process, water. For the past 100 years and over, we have been enjoying very low price of gasoline, but uh, the paradigm is changing now and since we uh, experienced a couple of oil crises, people understand that we are running out of uh, gasoline and crude oil, so we have to develop different type of uh, vehicles so that we could use less crude oil. Over in Korea, automaker Kia is among the few that have jumped on this fuel cell bandwagon. Their latest is a hydrogen fuel cell car named Borrego. This year is the first year for us to make over 100 fuel cell vehicles. We plan to produce 2,000 fuel cell vehicles during the three-year time span. This technology is still in its infancy. While it holds much promise, some obstacles still stand in the way. For a start, there's the challenge of supplying large quantities of hydrogen to consumers. Not an easy task, considering the density of the gas. How do you store hydrogen? Uh, a hydrogen cylinder that would provide the same amount of energy as a gasoline car tank would be probably hundreds of times larger. So we have to figure out how to compress the hydrogen, and that costs energy, and that's expensive also. Right now, Kia is testing its hydrogen cars on the roads. From 2015, we plan to go to the actual mass production stage with uh, 10,000 volume per year. So will hydrogen be fueling cars of the future? It's clearly a contest of competing technologies. The EV versus the hydrogen fuel cell vehicle. We strongly believe that electric vehicles and fuel cell vehicles have their own sectors. This may be a battle to be fought on future roads. On the left, the EV with its smaller size and shorter driving range for urban use. On the right, fuel cell vehicles that can be driven beyond 600 miles. Eventually, the marketplace has to decide which technology would win out. Beyond reinventing motors and looking for alternative power sources, scientists in Asia are rethinking the tiny components of the car. These design features are what will separate the cars of the future from those of today. Innovation will be the driving force. Engineers and designers race to dream up out of this world functions like radar that gauges distances or horns that target a single object. But one question remains, how possible are they?
Throughout Asia, auto designers and engineers try to outdo each other in a game worth billions of dollars. From Japan to China, Korea to Taiwan, it's a fierce fight to stay ahead of the competition. One thing will set them apart from each other, innovation. Car industry has to evolve into mobility industry. And that's gonna start happening somewhere. Without doing that, the car's gonna die. Singapore's Institute of Materials Research and Engineering has been exploring lightweight elements for cars for over five years. We have always been interested in materials that are light and that are strong. So the materials that we, we look at are mainly, we call it the carbon reinforced polymers or carbon reinforced plastics. Uh, some people call it CRP. Uh, those materials are very stable and they are, they are very heat resistive and they are very light and they're very strong. Light but strong sounds like an oxymoron, but not to these scientists. They are strong because they are using composite materials and on the other hand, they are very light because they are basically based on plastic technology. Competition is heating up among innovators in the auto industry. Another area that is hot? Innovations that make driving safer. Could the future be crash-proof? Michael Chia, an engineer with Singapore's Agency for Science, Technology and Research, is exploring one innovation with wave radar. When you are driving on the road, it's very hard to avoid sometimes blind spots. So if you have a way to see things behind the back of the head without too much of turning, you have a way to sense their presence ahead of time. It gives you sufficient time to react and therefore you can really reduce accident. It's all theoretical at this point, but Michael's worked out a simple prototype of this radar technology. Behind me is a prototype of the future millimeter wave radar. And this will detect the car in front of it. This will show the distance and the speed as it move away. This radar will be detecting the car in front and in future, incorporate future 360 degree scanning. What this means is a car that can detect the presence of other vehicles in front, at the back, by its side, anywhere around it. In Japan, engineer Eiji Shibata has a somewhat different idea, an innovation that will prove to be critical, especially since injuries caused by road accidents have been on the rise. Think a microcomputer can predict danger? Don't doubt it. Working with Subaru, he's devised a solution to prevent vehicle collisions, a stereoscopic eyesight system. The technology that drives the system is able to gauge when a collision is about to happen. The it's an exciting prospect that may revolutionize the auto industry and hopefully save lives. In Taiwan, another scientist has something else up his sleeves. Liao Rong Huang is a researcher at Taiwan's Industrial Technology Research Institute. 
sick of all the loud honking on the street? Liao has a plan. A digital steering wheel with a multi-directional horn. The device works by emitting separate ultrasonic waves. Only at their intersection would the sound be heard. Innovations like these will dictate the car of the future to be more than just a mode of transport. But the innovations won't necessarily be top down. There'll be a change in the way the game is played. Will we be ready for it? The vehicle of the future will see plenty of innovations that will change mobility as we see it now. But giant automotive companies may not necessarily be the ones taking lead. Bigger isn't necessarily better. Instead, it may be the small companies spearheading this revolution, nimble and willing to take risks. Freedom of ideas sometimes come from freedom of your economy, freedom of your decision-making process, freedom of taking risks. So if you're able to take certain risks and make certain critical decisions for your life or products that you're working on, then you come up with simply better ideas. In some ways, Ken Okuyama's boutique design firm is already a hint of that future. Ken's firm, Okuyama Designs, works with established names in the industry, such as Ferrari. We make these components and we assemble them in very local, small city with only about 20 people. That's our company is. That is not a typical what you think of, you know, mass production cars are made. But this is, in a way, kind of new way of making automobiles in a very small and local firm like, like us. <laughs> the trend is seen elsewhere in Asia. In Singapore, David Cho is an entrepreneur seizing the future now. His idea, a DIY car. Is the future in our own hands? As a boy growing up, I was very, very active. I skateboarded, I rode bicycles. When you're very active, you fall down and you knock into things. So I became quite handy. I would basically try and fix it myself whenever I could. And it made me realize that, you know, you can get things working again, you can change the design, and you can make it a better product. An avid fast car lover, this former banker coins his latest venture, the EV Hub, a research and design facility that converts old luxury cars into electric dynamites. People thought we were crazy. Um, they couldn't understand why you want to do such a thing. I went to my mechanic and I said, hey Albert, what do you think we take out the engine, put in an electric motor, put some batteries in there, and basically make it run on electricity? He looked at me with a look of a face of disbelief and said, why would you want to do that? Unlike EV manufacturers who build cars from scratch, David has a simple formula that doesn't require reinventing of the wheel. What we have here is a 2004 BMW 520, which was in fantastic shape. It had probably about 100,000 kilometers or so on it and we decide that by converting it, we can give it a new heart. We lifted out the combustion engine and we put in electronics, we put in batteries, we took out also things like the gas tank. This is what we removed. This very heavy, very dirty and smelly engine came out, it has 7,800 moving parts. In Singapore, where cars have shelf lives of no more than 20 years, 
these old luxury numbers have been given a new lease on life. We chose secondhand cars that we can identify with, are iconic. A BMW, a, a Renault van, these are cars that you see here on the streets of Singapore every day. And people can relate to them right away. This car can be plugged into a standard wall plug uh, outlet at home or at work. Before, they may have been scrapped after only five or seven years, even though it's in still perfectly good condition. Now we can drive them again. So far, David's converted three of them. A Porsche, a minivan, and a BMW sedan. This is just the first of David's many ideas for a cleaner, safer transport of the future. A future filled with much promise for his young son. Well, Cameron is seven months old, and when he is growing up, I'd like to see him in a world where he has lots of choices. He can ride an electric bicycle to school, or he can drive an electric car to go so, do some grocery shopping and take public transport that is clean and efficient. <laughs> drive a hybrid if he wants to, but basically have all the choices that are more sustainable and not reliant on just oil. The future is here, it is now. Futuristic transport may be here sooner than we think. From Singapore to Taiwan, Korea to Japan, governments are matching industry enthusiasm with millions of dollars of investment. Technologies that were once purely figments of the imagination are close to being realized. Future cars will only be limited by our imagination. It's really all uh, up to our imagination. What makes the future? It's your imagination. You have to dream. And based on that dream, you imagine and you make efforts to make it happen. So the end of the imagination is the end of the future. And I really think that, that if you have a goal, then you continue working toward that, your imagination will become reality. Thank you.